Hi guys, Max here and this is your daily update for yesterday the 26th of February. Now markets were closed and we're going to look mostly at the war in Ukraine of course, starting off with an update on what actually happened over the last day, but we're also going to look at developments regarding sanctions and the state of Russia itself right now. So to start off, what actually happened on the ground in Ukraine over the last day? Well, there was a lot of fighting that continued in the same sort of areas as the days before. Kiev, of course, being the capital of the country, was under attack again, slightly weaker than the day before, but still serious, and there were a lot of casualties and conflicts again. The Russians, though, actually failed to make any gains into the cities, as we saw the day before, and the city remains entirely in the control of the Ukrainians. Russian reinforcements have come from the Belarusian border. In particular, Chechen forces under the commando of Tushayev came to attack Kiev and to assist Russian forces. They were ambushed before they even got there though and reports of 50 armoured vehicles were destroyed have come out. They have now been confirmed and the commander is reportedly killed as well. Now this is a unit that is notorious for brutal actions across lots of different places and war crimes across the board and it was a very worrying development to see them deployed into Ukraine. It represented a potential brutalisation of the conflict and it's good news for sure to see them destroyed. There are, of course, a couple conflicting reports going back and forth. The Russians are denying pretty much everything that's going on. They're still claiming to have practically zero casualties, but this seems quite likely to be true to me. Now, further north of Kiev, Russian forces have been trying to take Chernihiv, and they've failed to take the city once more. This time, though, apparently they've given up. They've withdrawn from that city, and those forces are now moving south to assist on the attack of Kiev itself. The supposed plan from the Russians was to take that city very quickly and then move on to assist with the invasion of Kiev itself. So it makes sense that now that they can't take Chernihiv and they can't take Kiev either, they lump these forces together and concentrate on the more important target. We're also seeing similar reports coming from east of Kiev from the highway that links Sumy and Kiev together, where a lot of forces are making their way down to the capital. Now Kharkiv, east of Ukraine, has seen pretty much the heaviest fighting so far. It's been the worst in the country and it was as well yesterday. There were loads of Russian infantry and armour and they attacked and they actually made progress into the city. They actually got into the city, but they were ultimately repelled. Kharkiv right now is once again under full control of Ukraine. Now, I was covering this on Twitter overnight. There were a lot of serious engagements and it wasn't looking brilliant at all times. Lots of Russian troops were destroyed, many vehicles as well, and many were taken prisoner. And if you want to stay up to date on this conflict to see what's happening in real time, then my link for my Twitter will be down below as usual. Now, south of Ukraine from Crimea and the invasion coming from that side, the Russian army is actually continuing to make some progress and it's the only point where they're actually making decent progress. Russia have extended control along the Black Sea coast and they might have taken control of a city called Melitopol, but it is unclear as of yet. Russia claims that they have taken control and Western intelligence says they haven't. Now fighting from that front but on the western side continues as well around the city of Kherson. Once again there are conflicting reports coming out but the Russians claim to have blockaded the city maybe to have surrounded it entirely but the city itself is probably still in hands of the Ukrainians. In short though Russia is actually making progress on this front. It's slow and it's not without resistance but it is still progress. Now those are really the specific flashpoints of the conflict of the invasion but there are some other quick points that are worth mentioning. Now, Russian VDV troopers, paratroopers that we spoke about over the last couple of days, they've once again been sent into Kiev, this time south of the city to try and seize another airfield. Now, once more, you might be starting to sense a pattern here, but there are conflicting reports, but there's a possibility that another two IL-76 fixed-wing aircraft were shot down, laden with paratroopers ready to jump. We do know that paratroopers did drop out and they were repelled. They failed to secure that airport. And this is basically another disaster for the VDV. They've suffered very heavily heavy losses during this conflict in a really short amount of time without a doubt and there are huge questions in the west going around right now about their combat effectiveness. Now air superiority has still not been achieved by Russia. Ukrainian planes are still up and running and air defenses are still impactful as well though they are severely limited. This is a major hamper on Russian forces. They expected air support but they aren't getting any. Now logistics as well is still of course a major issue for Russia. There are more reports and more video footage emerging of hundreds of vehicles being abandoned on the side of the roads apparently just because they have no fuel to move. There was even a huge convoy of diesel trucks sent to assist Russian forces attacking Kiev from the west but it was destroyed by the Ukrainian air force. Now missiles, rockets and cruise missiles continue to hit population centres. Some don't seem to be targeting military targets at all, hitting residential buildings and road intersections as civilians go about their daily lives. 
Now these attacks are very sporadic and it's likely that Russia has far fewer of these weapons than they want Ukraine to believe. Some are clearly targeting storage depots, fuel sites, ammo weapons and things like that, but not all. Western intelligence has of course been damn near perfect at almost every opportunity the entire way through the Ukrainian crisis and into the invasion. Right now Western intelligence is telling us that the Russian offensive has only a few more days before it stalls entirely. This means we are likely to have very good ideas about the success of the invasion and how this situation might actually resolve itself within a week or so. Now what sort of losses for each side are we looking at right now? Well, for Russia, there are an estimated 4,300 troops killed. This comes from Ukraine and the numbers are probably inflated. We spoke a little bit about this yesterday. It's very difficult to know for sure, but losses for Russians are almost certainly in the thousands. There are well over 200 Russians taken prisoner as well, 27 planes have now been shot down, 26 helicopters as well, 146 tanks destroyed and over 700 APCs, armoured personnel carriers destroyed as well. Then of course there are a bunch of cars, artillery pieces, fuel tankers and things like that. In short though, Russia is suffering very heavy losses and they aren't getting any lighter. As of right now, Ukrainian forces are claiming 198 Ukrainians killed and 1100 injured. Now the information for the Ukrainian side of casualties is most accurate from Kiev and it's possible that they may be missing reports of casualties from other fronts which might explain the very low toll on the Ukrainian forces. Now Ukraine is not releasing figures of their material losses as they don't want to give this information to Russia so we really don't know what the situation is on that front. Now overnight, lots of Russian saboteurs were caught in various population centers getting about to dirty business. Russian army or special forces or some Russian separatists were out past curfew, they were painting lines on the ground to aid Russian forces to show them where certain targets are in future attacks and things like that. Some of them have been armed and some of them have shot at and fought against the army, the police and civilians. Really what we're seeing here is what we expect from Russia, little green men tactics we call it. It's not really legal, it's definitely not legitimate, but Russia just doesn't seem to care because these tactics tend to be very effective. Curfews have been put in place though in most Ukrainian cities past something like 5 or 6 p.m. So if anyone is out past that time, they get stopped by police and that tends to be when these saboteurs are out and about. What these tactics do mean is that we should expect the conflict to escalate and to get more and more brutal, we should expect more war crimes and these dodgy acts to be committed as time goes on. In short, Russia is failing to meet its objectives. It either has to negotiate, withdraw its forces or change strategy and what we're seeing right now is Russia starting to move towards the negotiate and the change strategy side of things at the same time. Now talking about negotiations, they are scheduled to start soon. Russia wanted them to happen in Belarus and that wasn't a very good idea because Belarus has declared it might join the invasion, they've given material support to Russia, Russia has invaded through their borders so that just wasn't really feasible. After some back and forth, negotiations are now due to take place on the Ukrainian-Belarusian border and it's unclear how productive they will be but we'll just have to wait and see for that. Now as for Russia itself, domestically the country is in a pretty awful state right now with over 3,000 protesters being arrested for being anti-war and being on the streets speaking out against Putin. On top of that, 5,000 Russian army soldiers from Belgorod refuse to deploy to Ukraine, they refuse to go to war. Russian soldiers are surrendering fairly easily, their morale is still very poor and they have little to no motivation or will to fight, they basically just don't want to be in Ukraine. Now financial sanctions are starting to kick off big time. Most Russian banks are to be cut off from SWIFT and the only transactions that are to be protected and that are going to be allowed to be run through SWIFT are gas sales and we can of course thank Germany for that. On top of that, Russian foreign reserves for their central bank that keep their government and their ruble, their currency stable, well they are largely stored overseas in foreign banks and institutions and they are going to be frozen across the board. Russian people are starting to see this news and they're starting to worry and a run on the banks is starting in Russia, people are taking out as much cash as they can from ATMs and this is awful news for Russian banks because they will literally run out of cash and then faith in their economic and their financial system will disappear. To be perfectly honest, there is a legitimate possibility that the Russian state might go the way of a failed state. These sanctions are going to be very, very effective. On top of that, NATO and the West has basically been united by this invasion of Ukraine. We are all now in agreement for increased opposition to Russia, for more troops in Eastern Europe, for example, and stronger forces in general. 
Germany, who has neglected forces for years now, they are going to increase their military budget by about 60% and add an extra 100 billion euros this year, which will mean spending per GDP for this year for their military will be around 5%, which is absolutely huge. Finally, there are early reports of major problems for Putin himself. There are some leaked details of a meeting between oligarchs and Putin about the situation in Ukraine, and it's come from an Estonian retired general. Now again, Western intelligence has been damn near perfect so far, so it is very feasible that this is real. Now from that meeting, what we've learned is that Russia basically expected the war to last between one and four days, and to follow the same sort of trajectory as the Georgian invasion of 2008. Some minor clashes with forces, then the total capitulation of Ukrainian forces and an easy time taking over the rest of the country. Russia had no tactical plan, and this is very likely to be true. If you check out my Twitter thread I made on that for more, link down below in the description. Basically, Russian troops have no idea how to fight against Ukraine, how to take land, how to engage in these cities, and there was clearly no planning done in advance. Russia reportedly only had rockets for three to four days of attacks, and then it would take them up to three months to produce more. If the Ukrainian invasion, if the war lasts for more than 10 days, Russia's going to have to seek an end via diplomatic means because they won't have the capacity to continue. The war is costing them $20 billion a day, so after 10 days, no money, no resources, and no more element of surprise. We also learned that Russian special forces have been in Ukraine since the 18th of February, and they were supposed to try and assassinate the Ukrainian government, Zelensky, and instill chaos to aid the Russian advance. In short, the Russian plan relied on panic. They only expected to fight in Kharkiv, and they thought that once that city was taken, Ukraine as a whole would then surrender, Zelensky would flee the country, and everything would collapse. Now this isn't 100% confirmed, but it does seem very reasonable. It comes from a very reliable source, and again, Western intelligence has so far been incredibly accurate. Basically what we're seeing is Ukraine is doing very well. They need to hold out for another week or so, but then we will probably know how this might all end. Huge respect is due to all Ukrainians, civilians, police, armed forces, and the government as well. They are terrifically brave, they are remaining controlled, treating Russian POWs well and with respect, and it's easy to descend into brutality. But they aren't doing that. Ukraine are doing almost everything perfectly here, and it's great to see. Despite that, there is a huge loss of life, and of course the world is wishing that this didn't happen, but we are where we are, and action has to be taken, and that's what we're seeing Ukraine do today. If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like and a comment to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like insight into my portfolio, and buying sell alerts for all my own investments. There's a link in the description to masterworks.io, a site that allows you to buy fractional shares of art from world famous artists like Banksy, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. It's completely free to sign up, you don't have to buy anything, you don't have to hand over any card information, so if that sounds interesting, then make sure to check it out. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stable coins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you get from any savings account these days, just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support, thanks for watching, stay stoic, until next time.